welcome everybody. It's just a minute past 11, so I'm sure you will probably be joining us. But in the meantime, uh, I'd like to welcome those of you who are with us today. Welcome some of you who've been to our previous webinars and also any new participants. This is the third of our Unhurt Children webinars. And my name's Joanna Clark. I'm the director of Deaf Child Worldwide. And Deaf Child Worldwide is part of the National Deaf Children's Society in the UK. We produced a report in December last year with, uh, very, with different chapters on different uh, topics, one of which was communities. And we're going to explore that a little bit more today. We've got two great presenters who will share some of their experiences of working, their own experiences and, and their experiences of working with deaf children and young people, particularly with those in communities that have very limited understanding often of deafness. So we'll also be exploring ways in which we can try to change some of that. There are just a few housekeeping. I'll just quickly mention a couple of uh, definitions that we will use during the, um, the webinar. We're using definitions that we use here at Deaf Child Worldwide. And I understand that there are different ways of um, describing deafness in different countries and cultures. But for the purposes of this webinar, when we say, when we talk about deafness, we're talking about all levels of deafness, both uh, moderate, um, mild, moderate, and profound. And when we refer to languages, we're speak, we're, we're referring to both spoken and signed languages. So just so that that's uh, understood as the basis for our discussions today. As, as I mentioned earlier, this is the third in a series of five webinars. Um, and we're going to, as a, we know from our work, we work with lots of communities and partners across South Asia and uh, East Africa. And we know that a lot of our work is about changing attitudes and behaviors of community, community members because there are lots of, there's a lot of misunderstanding about deafness uh, and lots where there's misunderstanding and where there isn't very much knowledge about deafness, all sorts of myths grow up. So we're going to just start, as I mentioned before, with a, a sh very short poll for you. It will come up on the screen in a moment. And we're just going to put up three statements, which are statements that we've come across on a regular basis in our work, and just ask you to say whether these are true or false. And be assured this is completely anonymous, so don't worry that anyone knows what anybody is saying, so please just say what you think. And I'll give you just, just uh, half a minute or so to have a look at those and uh, just click the but the the true or false statement and then we'll see we'll just talk about that very briefly once we get the results so i think we'll put the poll up there now and it's just three statements um that we'd like you to look at and see whether you think they are true or false I say, don't worry at all, this is completely anonymous. Okay, I think probably everybody's had time. Now we can have a quick look at the results. Great, that's, that's really interesting. 
And I think it just raises some of the issues that we will be talking about today, about perceptions and about knowledge. Uh, most, most of you have uh, considered that most of the, the, the statements are false. Uh, certainly in terms of um, sign language, it's, it's often assumed that there is only one sign language. In, in fact, there are sign languages in every country, just as there are spoken languages. There are multiple sign languages. And I think there is often a perception about deaf people's intelligence, sadly. We'll hear more of that from our speakers and the sort of perceptions people have uh, about anyone simply because they, they can't hear. And uh, deaf people not keeping secrets, I think no, everybody said that that was false. And I think uh, it's, it's one of these sort of interesting myths that sometimes builds up in communities uh, for no apparent reason whatsoever. So this is just three of, of the sort of statements and myths and misconceptions or misunderstandings that we come across on a regular basis. So thank you very much for participating in that, uh, in that poll. I think, um, you know, a lot of the, the reasons why some of these myths emerge in communities is because of there isn't there is very little deaf awareness um, and very little understanding about deaf and awareness about um, how what causes deafness and so on and so forth. So unfortunately, there is off this often results in quite a lot of uh, negative attitudes and approaches, and it can contribute to really stigmatizing both deaf children and their families and isolating them in their communities. I think perhaps what's um, also often disappointing to say the least in a lot of our work is that we also find that professionals who we would perhaps expect to have more knowledge and understanding such as doctors, nurses, police, religious leaders, and even, even teachers don't really understand deafness uh, themselves either and have very little knowledge of the subject. Uh, it's, it's also true to say that, you know, inevitably some organisations who work with, with disabled children will not necessarily have any sort of specialist understanding of deafness. So we do believe that increasing awareness throughout the community, awareness of deafness and understanding of deafness is really a vital part of, um, of our work and, and it's vital for all of us uh, to be involved in that. I think to talk a lot more about this, I'm going to, without further ado, introduce you to our first speaker, who is Richard Mativu Musao, who is, has been our senior technical advisor at Deaf Child Worldwide in East Africa for the last eight years. And Richard has a wealth of experience um, working across projects in, in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania with us. Uh, he will be giving you the, the benefit of all his knowledge and experience in a moment. And he will be, the, the presentation is recorded uh, and Richard will be presenting in Kenyan Sign Language, which is being interpreted by Robert, his interpreter, and he is in the background interpreting into English. Um, whilst Richard presents, if you think of questions, as I said before, please do put them in the chat box and we will keep those so that we can discuss further. Although the presentation is recorded, I'm very pleased to say that Richard will be with us live on the panel for discussion after uh, his and our next speaker's presentation. So thank you very much. And we'll uh, just prepare the, the video for you to see. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, so 
My name is Richard Mativu, and I work with Deaf Child Worldwide, and I'm based in Nairobi, in Kenya. Uh, that's Nairobi. So today I am happy to be presenting in today's webinar, and I'll be focusing on the uh, on communities. So the first question that I want to ask all of you. When you look at a person, can you tell if the person is deaf or hearing? Can you be able to know? It's very hard. It's very hard to tell. You cannot know by just uh, looking at a person. You can't tell if they are hearing or deaf. It's very hard. And that's why many people say that deafness is hidden. It's a hidden disability because you cannot be able to see deafness. So, and another surprising thing, do you know that uh, we have uh, many hearing people who have never met deaf people? Yeah, we, we have people who have never met deaf people and uh, they will struggle to communicate uh, when, whenever they meet the deaf people. Because when they meet them, they freeze. They don't know how to communicate. And uh, at that time, it becomes hard to communicate with the deaf people because they've never had an experience uh, with a deaf person. And that's the world that we live in. So, now I want to discuss uh, some common challenges or barriers that deaf people experience and uh, also some solutions and, uh, and then we are done. So the first uh, challenge is accessibility because remember that uh, communication or assistive devices or lang languages and all that. So you will find many deaf people cannot access services in the community. Because uh, it might sound easy, but it's not easy. Why? Because for you, yes, if you want to go to the police station and report something, maybe you want to report something simple. Uh, but for a deaf person, if they go to the police station, they will find it hard uh, trying to communicate or explain uh, themselves to the police, man or woman. If they want to go to courts, that's another big problem because the courts are not accessible. And uh, this is a big problem because someone cannot access schools because uh, the schools will say that uh, we cannot admit a deaf, uh, we cannot admit deaf people. We cannot admit deaf people because we don't have teachers who know sign language. So this uh, becomes a very big challenge. Another issue is uh, schools for the deaf. Uh, this, um, big problems, especially in our region in East Africa. Uh, most uh, most uh, uh, school for the deaf are uh, special, or uh, uh, residential schools. So a child needs to travel very many miles away from home to attend school. So many times they have to sleep uh, in school because the school is far. But you find a hearing child uh, will just walk uh, to school, come back home in the evening. So this is not fair. Why? Because deaf children uh, want to live and grow in their families. But now, we find that uh, they have to go very far uh, for school. Another big issue is uh, delayed language development. Mostly because uh, most deaf children are born to hearing families. So it's not easy find a, com a parent uh, communicating because sometimes parents uh, don't have time to go and learn sign language. It becomes a, a parent uh, and the deaf child will later on find uh, the child will find sign language in school. So if the child is not using sign language, it's okay, they're lucky. But at the same time, at what age will they uh, get that assistive device? or like a cochlear implant or a hearing aid, they'll get it later, maybe later, their old age. So they will have missed uh, 
the key uh, duration for the language development and they will miss that time, which is very important uh, before four years, uh, before the age of four. And another challenge is the so uh, social attitude and uh, stereotypes. Stereotypes in the society. This is a big problem. Uh, some community, uh, some communities look at deaf as a curse, and this is very retrogressive. Retrogressive. They feel it's like a curse. Maybe the family did something wrong, and God punished them, punished the family, or maybe the mother or the father laughed. They laughed at uh, another disability, so uh, God did justice and uh, gave them a child who has disabilities. But that's not true. This is not uh, good because uh, you'll find that uh, parents will hide their children, their, their deaf children, because uh, they fear uh, shame from the community. They don't want uh, the neighbors to see that they have deaf children, so they will hide the deaf children because they think that uh, if they find that I have a deaf child, then probably they might think I'm cast. Another funny challenge or stereotype in the society. Uh, we look at deaf people and uh, we feel like uh, the, society, the society's expectations on a deaf person is very low. That's why you find that sometimes a deaf person can do something which is normal. Something that is not uh, great. Something that is not except, uh, is not great, exceptionally great. Not something to be surprised at. But uh, when they do that, you will see people uh, praising them, praising them. Wow, wow, you've done something. Uh, something that is so great, exceptional, great. No, no, no. But you see, they've answered a very simple question, a very simple, basic question. But you will see the reaction on how people will react. Uh, it will be different from a hearing person answering the same question. They'll be like, yeah, it's okay. But when a deaf person does that, oh my God, oh, they praise them, oh, you are clever and all that. This shows that uh, it's like people thought that the deaf person uh, cannot be able to answer that. So they are surprised when a deaf person answers that. But it's a basic and a normal question. Some, uh, if a deaf person does something simple, maybe driving, maybe building a home, maybe getting married, people will feel like, ah, oh, this is a big achievement. And it should not be. Because sometimes it shows that uh, the society's expectation is very low. People may be expected to struggle forever. So, a simple, a simple and a normal uh, achievement becomes a, a, a exceptional achievement. Another one is autism, where people uh, look at a person or who hears that uh, is better or superior. They are better than a deaf person. If you can't hear, ah, you are you you are you are you are a bit low. But a uh, hearing person is high. So this is a problem because the schools for the deaf, in the schools of the deaf, this is a big problem with the teachers especially because they will be giving responsibilities to deaf children with some residual hearing, some residual hearing, maybe like hard of hearing. They are given more responsibilities than the ones who are profound deaf. Because the ones that are profound deaf teachers will be like, oh, it's hard to communicate with this one. Let me give the hard of hearing responsibilities because they feel like uh, it will be easy to communicate with them because they have a, a residual hearing and they can hear a little bit. So they'll be like, ah, oh, the person who is prof profound deaf uh, to continue that way. So I want to propose some solutions. And the first and very important is uh, deaf awareness. Deaf awareness. We need deaf awareness, all over. We need uh, people to know that deafness is not a curse, that any, pers any person can become deaf because of sickness, 
because of me medication and uh, maybe accidents maybe you can break your eardrums and these are the challenges because uh, some are permanent and some might need surgery uh, and uh, we need to create more awareness so that people can know that not all deaf people use sign language for instance so we need uh, the social attitudes to be broken uh, through awareness our campaigns and all that another one for the schools for the schools uh, the schools need to, need to be closer and also the quality of education is very important for example now you might uh, see deaf people going to school but when they are done with their exams the certificate when you see the grades that they get from school or the achievement they are not exciting you'll find that uh, they get uh, low grades like uh, a D and E which is not good and you can't go to maybe to the universities or colleges with an E you cannot because uh, the problem is not deaf people but the quality of education is the problem we need to make sure that uh, 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 learning is a uh, uh, learning excellence for the deaf another big issue is access to rich language so when a deaf child is born parents need to learn sign language or work closer with the, any organization uh, or maybe deaf role models and make sure that the children get rich language uh, to grow very well because parents at times might not have money to pay for the sign language so on the programs needs to be there to assist the parents now we have some deaf people who maybe uh, didn't uh, finish school or maybe they finished school and they never passed well so we need vocational skills training we need so that they can get uh, jobs so we need vocational skills uh, to support the deaf people who are out there without jobs and the health is not accessible because uh, doctors cannot sign. Doctors uh, don't know sign language. The nurses too. So maybe it's okay. We have interpreters in the hospitals. Yes, that's okay. But at the same time, we want nurses to learn sign language. It's very important. Very important because in the hospitals, they have uh, specific vocabularies. And it's very important to have a medic learn uh, sign language for better communication and also it will help uh, in uh, confidentiality or privacy another one social inclusion of the deaf if you have programs please try and and let deaf people work with you employ deaf people they can be volunteers they can be staff they can be interns or they can be community mobilizers kindly have programs for the deaf if you have programs for the deaf let uh, deaf people be involved in those programs very important finally uh, from all these you you see uh, sometimes why deaf advocates say that uh, deaf is a cultural minority because they feel that uh, deaf have uh, the deaf people have their own language and uh, in Kenya we have KSL in Uganda we have USL in Tanzania we have TSL those are distinctive language or distinct language and should be respected so deaf advocates feel that uh, deaf is a cultural minority and there is a funny thing did you know that uh, we can reverse roles in deafness. Why are hearing people can find themselves uh, needing 
help or maybe uh, to access services. For example, if you are a hearing person and then you went to a church for the deaf, then you find the pastor who is preaching is uh, deaf and they're preaching in sign language, the songs are done in sign language, and uh, every member of the church knows sign language. So in that scenario, who needs interpretation services? It will be the hearing person, yeah? Uh, will the deaf need the interpretation services? No. So deafness is a unique disability. I want to close by, by a short story or a short case study from our work in Uganda. Where one of our partners, our partner organizations, uh, working in Uganda, we had a family where they, they, they gave birth to a deaf child. And the family was devastated. Uh, because uh, they got a deaf child and they didn't know what to do. So they hid the child. They feared that the neighbors would make fun of them, of their deaf child. And they would say that uh, they would uh, call the child uh, names like Kasiru, funny, funny names and bad names. So the family was stressed. And later on, most uh, neighbors felt that uh, your deaf child will never become anything. But later on, the family met the organization that this W supports. And they got a lot of uh, advice and counseling and uh, they were supported to learn sign language. And uh, they were required where to take the child. And uh, it was positive and they joined a parent support group, which was nice. And uh, they became so strong, they became strong advocates. And now, the child is uh, still in school and the parent later got two other deaf children. But now they were very happy, they were confident because uh, they would know what to do with their deaf children. And it was easy to care for these children. So in this story, uh, finally as I close, kindly join us and let us become deaf inclusion champions. Let's work together to break the barriers and also at the same time enjoy learning sign language, which is easy. Just try and learn sign language. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. That was a really thought-provoking presentation. Uh, there's so much in there. I'm sure that as you've been listening, you've been thinking of things that you'd want to talk about in, in the breakout groups and also questions that you might have for Richard. I think a particularly uh, interesting point about audism and just our assumptions, all the assumptions that so many of us make about deafness. And these are sort of reinforced into stigma and, and often negative, very negative attitudes if that is combined with really no knowledge whatsoever about deafness. And this is often what we come across in uh, some of the communities that Deaf Child Worldwide and our partners work with. Anyway, before we go on to question and answer uh, session, I would like to introduce our next presenter, uh, Pradeep Kumar Sabat, who is, works with one of our partner organizations in Odisha, India. Uh, he works for the Citizens Association for Rural Development, and he plays um, a, a crucial role as a community worker, doing a lot of work both with families and the wider community. And absolutely crucially, uh, because uh, Pradeep is himself deaf, he plays a, a critical role as, as what we refer to as a deaf role model, uh, because often the families and people he works with may not either know anything about deafness and may never even have met a deaf person before. And certainly families may not have, until they've met somebody like Pradeep, may not have any understanding of just what their deaf children can achieve. 
Again, as Pradeep, Pradeep's uh, presentation is just a short one and recorded, but he will be also joining us live for on the panel for questions and answers. So um, over to Pradeep. Namaskar, Mona, Pradi, Kumar, Sabad, Mo, Card NGO Re, Dev Role Model Babe, Kamagore, Mate, Panchama Sobere, Mo Bapama, Mo. डेव थिबा जानिथिले मो बापा मा छोटो बेळु मो सह साइन रे जोगाजोग करथिले मो प्रथमे छोटो रु हियरिंग पिलां को सह पढुथिले ता परे पुणी स्पेशल स्कूल को चेंज करले मो 10थ पास करे मोर संग साथी आ पेरेंट्स मान को सहायता रे हैदराबाद रे आईटीआई पास करले एवं ता परे मैसूर रे कंप्यूटर रे डिप्लोमा पास करले किछि दिन कंप्यूटर ऑपरेटर भाबे काम करला परे वर्तमान 7 वर्ष हेबो डीसीडब्ल्यू प्रोजेक्ट रे डीआरएम भाबे डेव पिला को पाई काम करछु मु श्रवण बाधित पिला युवक ओ सेमाने को पिता माता को ओ मोर स्टाफ को आईएसएल शिक्षा दिए कोरोना समय मो पई सबुठो कष्ट करो थिला कोरोना समय रे लेसन एडप्टेशन को वीडियो करलो एवं छोटो छोटो पिला को पाखु व्हाट्सएप माध्यम रे पठाइलो छोटो पिलां को आठ करिया पाई मध्य उच्चाहित कोले। स्वाभाविक बाधित तो जुबा को मानन करो। एको वार्षिक ग्रुप करी कोरोना उपरे भिन्न भिन्न स्वच्छतनता मैसेज पढ़ाई। वर्तमान मु बहुत खुशी जे आमर स्वाभाविक बाधित तो जुबा को माने नुआ नुआ मैसेज कलेक्ट करी आम बाखू पढ़ू चंदी। वर्तमान आमो प्रोजेक्ट एरिया रे पेरेंट्स माने पिला मानो को पाठ पढ़ा रे सहायज्य कर चंदी हियरिंग पिलां का सह डेव पिला माने मिसी पाठ पढ़ी फर्स्ट क्लास रे पास हो चंदी मु सबनो बादी तो पिलां का पाई कामो करती आरु बहुत खुशी तेरो डीसीडब्ल्यू एवं कार्ड ऑर्गेनाइजेशन को धन्यवाद जाना चाहिए Thank you very much, Pradeep. And uh, I think that presentation gives you all an excellent idea of why it's so important to have uh, people such as Pradeep as deaf role models for children in his community. And I'm sure you can uh, see what an excellent role he plays doing that. Now, we're going to have uh, our panel discussion. We're now ready for our, uh, our panel discussion. Please do keep asking questions um, and putting them in the chat box. But um, first of all, I'd like to introduce Nita Gopalakrishnan, who has joined us on the panel. And Nita works as senior advisor on deafness for Deaf Child Worldwide in India. And uh, Nita is uh, hearing, uh, but she grew up in a family where her parents are both deaf. So she's actually bilingual in terms of sign language and spoken language, and obviously has another perception of what it's like as being part of uh, growing up in part of the deaf community. So thank you very much, Nita, for joining us uh, today. 
And just to start us off, actually, to, I'm going to ask uh, Pradeep, who, no, thank you, Pradeep, for your presentation. And uh, towards the end of the presentation, you were talking about um, using WhatsApp to communicate with deaf children and young people, and particularly to ask them, uh, to inform them about some of the COVID-19, the pandemic issues. And I wondered if you could tell us a bit about that and whether that is partly because information is not easily accessible or is not reaching deaf children and young people, information about the pandemic. Hi, everyone. Uh, due to the COVID pandemic, we had a lot of issues. Uh, we weren't able to, uh, as for me, I wasn't able to visit the parents. And uh, after a lot of discussion with my uh, organization, we made a lot of videos regarding the COVID pandemic, which was disseminated by the government and other sources. And, um, you know, about uh, how uh, we need to uh, safeguard ourselves during the COVID pandemic, the different issues that we need to take care of. But uh, we had a lot of people who had uh, no ways to communicate with, and then uh, they didn't have any smartphones. So uh, we had a lot of discussion uh, with our organization, and uh, we created a lot of media, and uh, we made a list of people who had smartphones and all that. And, uh, and we also made a list of uh, vocabulary and then uh, using the WhatsApp group, so we actually disseminated this information. And um, a lot of parents, uh, they learned uh, about this information from us. Uh, they didn't uh, get this kind of information before. Prior to that, because uh, they couldn't understand a lot of information from the other sources. And additionally, uh, the DYP is the Deaf Youth uh, Project of members. We also use them to disseminate a lot of uh, information and to create awareness. And uh, uh, using a lot of videos that we have generated. And uh, so a lot of information was generated and disseminated and they were, they were brought awareness to us. And, uh, they actually were very grateful to us for this kind of information. Also, uh, the neighbors, we also uh, told them that we should be careful while uh, going outside and uh, while we are involved in any kind of activities or games. So previously, what used to happen is, like uh, in a deaf family, the deaf people are always usually infected, they're uh, using accommodations and all that. So what I used to do, we had uh, created a lot of ideas and given a lot of ideas to have and do different kind of activities like drawing and sketching and different kinds of artwork. So when parents see the kinds of artwork and skills they have done, they are kind of very happy with what uh, they have done sitting at home itself. So this kind of activities have created a lot of awareness. And uh, even the neighbors, when they see them, they are kind of really amazed on how well these deaf children can do. And uh, they're really thankful to the organization of, for encouraging these kind of deaf children to show their skills and try and progress. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Pradeep. I think I think we'll sort of come, be talking about the challenges of communication uh, throughout because this is always always a, a big issue. Um, I'm going to just perhaps ask Richard a question now, slightly different, just based on some of the things um, that you presented, Richard, and particularly the issue about deafness being perceived as a curse, and you know perhaps where that where that perception comes from and who do we need to be working with to try to overcome that? Uh, 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Uh, that's a very important question, especially for Africa. So in East Africa, you'll find that many communities, uh, they still hold on the view that, that deafness is a curse from many communities, not urban centers, not towns, no, 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 but in the villages, all that. So you'll find that sometimes the families will hide their children because uh, when the community sees a deaf child and see the deafness as a curse, the family does not want uh, the community to see that they have deaf children because they're ashamed. And the community will think that this family is cursed. And that's why maybe God punished them. You see? So they hide their children. So this has been a big challenge. But we are working with partners in East Africa uh, to break these barriers. We are doing a lot of awareness in the communities, trying to connect them with the health workers so that they can help in assessment to help the parents understand uh, why their deaf children cannot hear. And also at the same time, we try to help them learn the language and get assistive devices. And this will make the parents see uh, from a deep deafness from a different perspective. At the same time now, we've been able to reach parents and uh, we've been working with some community leaders, for example, community health workers. You also have parents associations in different uh, places. These parents associations are very impactful because uh, they are the parents in the community and they, they will reach out to the neighbor and they will know which neighbor has a deaf child and they will try and help these parents. And also at the same time, for example, when we did uh, the Deaf Awareness Week, the parents groups, they have different activities, grassroots activities. They do processions, which help uh, other parents to see uh, that parents of the deaf, they are, uh, they, they are doing a procession. And the way so they will look at them and they will feel proud and we also we are working with priests or pastors. These are religious leaders. They are very influential in the community. Uh, working together with them, maybe churches to inform their members that if you have a deaf child, please just uh, connect with our local partner. And also we are working with government officials, health centers, the, admi the administration like the chief and all that. Finally, we must always work with our deaf role models because you'll find that the deaf role models, uh, they have local associations. And uh, they, they will try to advocate at the local level, um, do awareness, uh, teach sign language. And these role models are very good because at the same time, the deaf child will try to meet with this deaf role model and the deaf role model will help the child learn the language. And the parents can see that other deaf people can work. And, uh, they, they can become economically productive in the community, which will help the parent to accept the deaf child. And that's why uh, when they see other deaf children, deaf people working in the society. So this is how we can approach this. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I should say we're getting some interesting questions coming through. They're quite big questions, some of them. And I think perhaps some can be answered when we go into our breakout groups. Um, did Pradeep want to say anything there? Yeah, did you want to add to that? Uh, yes, I would like yeah. to add to what uh, Richard has said. Uh, regarding the deaf child, uh, parents also feel, you know, like uh, they look like a deaf child. So when they see deaf role models, the parents usually change their attitude and perception. And uh, they learn a lot from other role models and they build their confidence themselves. And they are confident enough uh, to know and be aware that, that people can be equal to their own people. And when I show them that uh, all my qualifications and the kind of the community I am involved in and the, what I bring to the table. So uh, when the parents see my achievements, uh, they are really confident and. Uh, 
So uh, when we in, uh, also when we invite government officials and other people to our uh, programs uh, organized by the deaf people, so this also creates a lot of awareness, and uh, the government uh, gives a lot of funding and uh, um, you know social security and uh, food security and a lot of grants and donations can be available to us. So we should continue advocating and fight against discrimination and, you know, like, uh, right. to work towards the Indian Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pradeep. Um, I'm going to try, try and get you all to tackle uh, another quite big question here. Uh, we have a question about the differentiating, can we differentiate between what are sort of some of the universal barriers that are faced by deaf people and those which are specific perhaps to a particular culture? Now, I, the, this is a very big question, obviously, but Richard mentioned, for example, the, the, the tendency to think of deafness as a curse in some communities. I'm going to I'm going to put this one to Nita. <laughs> That's a difficult one. Just to think, you know, is that something that you would come across in India? Or you know, do you think there are any particular cultural issues that make that are specific perhaps to India? Or, you know, to what extent are do you think these are really very much universal issues? Right. Thank you for that question, Joanna. I know it is a big one and a difficult <laughs> one to answer. But yes, like you rightly said, it is uh, quite specific to certain cultures where um, it's strongly believed that, you know, the term karma, which many of you may have heard, it is believed that what you have done in your past life, you know, is a baggage that you carry, either positive or negative, and then that, you know, manifests in your next life. And that strong belief, which, which you know, co co continues in a community and it's very very strong so even if one person wants to break away from it it's quite difficult to do so so that pressure of the community and the belief actually does make them feel that it is some wrongdoing that they did or a sin that they did which is you know probably um, um, the reason why their child is deaf but universally um I think there are many cultures which do believe this, but I won't be able to comment if it is universal. Um, yeah, but I, I do believe that there are a lot of cultures which believe this. Mm -hmm. I wonder, um, you know, if there are any other, is there uh, sometimes when you're, when you're talking perhaps to the community members or to um, parents or or to hearing siblings, what are the questions that they will ask about deafness? What, what perhaps do they not understand? And what do you have to explain to them? Right. Uh, so, with me, like uh, in my experience, when I am a deaf person, when I, uh, you know, visit uh, parents, um, they have uh, no concept of sign language, and even the siblings, um, they just gesture a lot, um, new gesture, and uh, uh, when I use sign language, then they see how I use sign language, and they can. Uh, they can learn from me and uh, and also Education. many of the um, many of the children when they go for mainstreaming they find it very difficult When I go um, since I've been to the special school and I know how to sign, I also know different kinds of uh, sign variations. 
So when uh, some of the parents think that sign language is not good, but I tell them that sign language is really good. I'm really confident using sign language. So when parents, uh, um, they have a dead child, they will visit uh, different hospitals and uh, they really uh, tend to stress about uh, how they would uh, raise the child. And uh, they teach, uh, they follow the oral method and they teach just a few words. And when I meet them, um, I try and communicate with them, I uh, use signs and uh, when the deaf child, uh, it, it is the same case with me when I visited different places like right? being to Hyderabad and all these places. Um, I learned sign language and I'm really confident using that right now. So it's been a study for 10 years. In fact. Thank you very much. Richard, would you like to add to that? Yes, yes, yes. I want to add on Nita's question on the universal and uh, cultural or local. So I'm looking at this from a human rights perspective uh, to show the universal barriers. For example, let's talk about participation or inclusion. You'll find that uh, th this challenge is everywhere, the north, south, east or west. Are deaf people being included in any programs or are, are they participating? Maybe you work in programs to reach children generally, but you think of deaf children who need your services. They participate. If the deaf children are there, what level of participation is there? Can their voices be heard? Secondly, uh, talking about the laws, because we have laws protecting that provides uh, for deaf children and youth, do we have laws that uh, recognize sign language? You see, like in Kenya, we've recognized sign language in our constitution. In Kenya, Kenya sign language is there in the constitution, but some countries are still struggling to have sign language being recognized by the government. They are, they are posting oralism and all that. The other one, when we talk about autism, this is a universal challenge. Everywhere. I know Joanna said that uh, we'll discuss this more uh, when we go to our breakout rooms. But uh, from, wh from wherever we are, here, sometimes we feel that hearing people are more, like maybe more better than deaf uh, people, that speech is better than sign language. Another one, when we think uh, locally, we have the attitudes. We have the stereotypes or maybe superstitions. For example, in some communities, they think that because of uh, their low level of awareness, they think that uh, deafness must be genetic. This means that uh, maybe in the family, the father thinks that in my family, we've never had a deaf person in my family. And then uh, they give birth to a deaf uh, child, they will he will divorce the wife because he'll be like, this is not my child. Maybe others think about uh, a curse. Maybe you loved uh, the person who had disability, and so you gave birth to a deaf child. You see, each culture has their own ways of thinking about deafness. Mm -hmm. In Uganda, they call a deaf person Kasiru, which is not a good name. Finally, we have a project in Loitoktok, or Loitoktok in Kenya, Loitoktok, where we have a Maasai community. And uh, we found that uh, we had uh, a lot of ear infections, ear infections, because most of the mothers, when they were breastfeeding their children, the milk was spilling. The milk was spilling to the child's ear. And uh, they didn't have good hygiene and all that. So infection rates were very high. You see now this is another issue. And uh, these are the few answers that I would give to that. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And our time is really up, but just to our facilitators, I'm going to take just one more minute and I'm going to ask Nita one last 
just question and that will maybe lead us into our next discussion and we'll come back to Pradeep in in a second. Uh, Nita, you mentioned, uh, and I think this is a very lengthy discussion, but you mentioned um, karma, for example, and I think most societies, whether they call it karma or not, have some sort of uh, understanding of that. And I just wonder, it, it is very ingrained into the way people are brought up to think and feel. And I wonder, where do you start to try to change that perception in a way, not change karma, but change the perception? Right. Um, really good question and an important <laughs> one. <laughs> right. So I think uh, a very good step to start uh, would be, um, you know, deaf awareness, just to get people to start thinking about deafness and as a issue that is specific to certain um, deficiencies because of the year, something that is not working in the year, and that's it. And not as uh, some curse or something that somebody else has done, but it is something to do with some medical, uh, you know, issue that has happened. But also, I think the next step would be to get them to understand what is the implication of not addressing it the right way or looking at it the right way, what could happen. And uh, which is what I think uh, families and communities will probably, you know, uh, relate to and understand to see that, okay, whatever has happened, it is what, what do we do next? I think getting them to that stage of, well, yes, we, um, there is a deaf child. It is uh, to understand why it happened and then what is it that we can do next? So this, this level of awareness, I think, uh, is key for them to start accepting that this is not a curse and this is not a karma and that it could happen to anybody. And giving them access to other deaf people, being able to see other deaf people who have really done well, um, are doing well, you know, in uh, education, in uh, workplaces, in all of this. I think that also, you know, changes their perspective of uh, looking at deaf people. Thank you very much, Nita. Big question. And I think thank you very much for <laughs> tackling it so well. I think we, we we do have to finish now. I can see Pradeep wants one last word. So the, the last word to Pradeep, and then we will be moving into breakout rooms. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you, Joanna. Uh, for a deaf child, uh, when you go for an audiology testing, um, you know, like uh, we test whether the hearing loss is uh, mild, moderate, or severe. So the parents are not aware of what is the audiology testing for and what uh, mild means, moderate means, what the victim measurement means. But they're not aware of that also. And uh, we should also give them awareness about the different assistive aids, about hearing aids and cognitive implants. And uh, and then what it means to be have a body plus 40 dB hearing loss or 60 dB hearing loss and uh, you know like how speech can be developed and uh, these kinds of things uh, the parents are not aware of at all so such awareness also should be given and uh, we have hard of hearing people who can hear and uh, such kind of awareness must also be given and a lot of research has to be done and uh, these are all necessary, absolutely right. necessary to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to all our panel members. We, we could always do with longer, but we are going to break now into two breakout rooms. And for everyone um, who's, who's with us on the webinar, everyone who's been on the panel will be in the breakout rooms and you'll be invited to join uh, a room very soon on your screen. I think everybody's uh, back now and we have our interpreters here. So thank you very much to all our interpreters throughout, I should say. Um, I, there is, we're nearly at the end of our time. So just to uh, say, I do hope you had managed to have some interesting discussion in the breakout groups. I know time is very short, but thank you very much for everybody for your participation. Um, 
I just want to let you know that, uh, as I said earlier, we're having a series of five webinars this year. There are two more to go. And in September, we'll be having a webinar about education and the challenges of um, education and, and, and for deaf children and young people. It's a huge topic um, and made even bigger by all the recent um, challenges of the pandemic, particularly where schools across the world have been closed for so long. Um, so there'll be lots to discuss there. And look, I look forward to seeing you all there in September. We're just lining up some really exciting speakers and we will be contacting you and communicating with you as soon as we've got the final date, but it's likely to be the first week in September. And in October, we'll be exploring the issue around independence and how to support young people to develop their sort of not just not just livelihood skills, but relationship skills and all the things around independence that uh, are of particular uh, critical um, interest for regarding deaf children and young people. So the webinars are all, we try to keep exactly to an hour and a half, so they're not very long. Uh, but I think probably today's webinar highlights as more than almost any other the critical need for deaf awareness more generally. Um, and across both communities, professionals and organisations. And that's why Deaf Child Worldwide has developed training modules for deaf awareness, which we can customize and adapt to your needs. So please do, uh, if you are interested in hearing more about those or exploring uh, having some customized training for your organization, please do contact us and we'd be really happy to talk with you about that. Uh, the information's up on the board and we will be contacting you all after this with a little bit more information about follow-up to the webinars. We would also really um, uh, ask you to fill in the survey, which we'll, we will also send you. It's only short, but the more we hear from you, the better we can um, organise webinars that you, know, you will find really useful. Um, so we really look forward to hearing from you. Thank you all again for joining us. Thank you to all our panel members and our presenters. And thank you to our interpreters and palantypists. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon.